curious how many of you, your paradise is indeed kind of a beach or ocean tropical place. How many of you are tropical paradise people? How many of you are kind of mountain woods people? You know, when I did a Google search for paradise, the mountain wood picture didn't even come up. So, but I thought of it, but I'm still tropical. <laughs> yeah, paradise. Anybody different than either the cabin in the woods? Where's your paradise? Shout it out. Arizona in the winter, woo-hoo! That is so true, that's coming. We got one more month, maybe one and a half. Yeah, we do kind of live in paradise here. Today we're gonna be looking at the original paradise. Remember Genesis' origins? <clears throat> the original paradise, we're gonna take a closer look at the account of Adam and Eve. And what I, what I titled the innocence of Eden, okay? This is the place, the Garden of Eden. And it's the innocence that took place and what happened in the design there. The design of the land, the plan for man, the design for marriage and intimacy, all of it is what we really would consider paradise. We wouldn't just want to vacation in the Eden we're gonna read about today. We would want to live there. We would wanna stay there. There was no stress, there was no bad weather, there was no texting, there was no unruly boss, no pollution, no litter, no expensive dinner menu, no dress code. In fact, there was no dress. <laughs> so, because there was no shame. So it would have been like easy peasy. That's okay, because it was innocent. It was truly paradise, and people really did live there at one point. So, grab your passports. We're gonna be traveling back all the way to the Garden of Eden this morning. Let me open us up in prayer. God, thank you so much for who you are. We love you being our father, being our daddy, being our God, being our king. All these names, uh, they mean so much to us in our personal lives, and we just thank you for that. I thank you for meeting us here this morning. I pray that we just put anything aside in a way that maybe have brought in with us any stresses or struggles or challenges, um, frustrations or heartaches. God, we lay them at your feet and we come to you focused fully on your word and trusting that your Holy Spirit will speak to us today. God, we pray for the sisters who are not able to join us today, whether they're traveling, many have health issues. God, we just ask that you would put your hand over them, protect them, give them divine care, <clears throat> heal them, Lord, comfort them, strengthen them in the place where they are at. We love them. Let them uh, be felt and wrapped in your love today. So we lift those up to you. God, be with us. Change us for the better. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Turning your Bibles to chapter 2, we're on page 2 now, look at us, we're moving and grooving in the book of Genesis. Not too hard to find still. <clears throat> chapter 2, we're going to be starting in verse 4, and this is what verse 4 says. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. So we just last week looked at all of creation, day, days 1 through 6. And then verse 4 says this is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. But it's like, didn't we just read about that? So now are we having a second account? No, this is not another account. It is not a separate account. The word account here in the Hebrew means toleda. I've got to get my little... There we go. <laughs> toleda. And it actually means generations. So this is the account of generations or the account of men and their descendants. So now we're specifically looking at the account of when man was created and all of their descendants. In chapter one, we got the general information that male and female were created in God's image. And it told us that they were created on the sixth day. Now here in chapter two, what we're getting is a detailed account of that event. This was very typical in Hebrew style. It's kind of like looking, think of it as looking at the cover of a magazine. It'd be saying like, God created male and female in his image. Turn to page 43. <clears throat> okay, so you slip, flip to page 43 and now you have the article of what that was about. So chapter one is kind of like the cover. God created man and male and female in his image. And now chapter two is the article or the detailed accounts of what we find of Adam and Eve and the beginning of all generations and all descendants. 
So here we really have man become, becoming the subject of Genesis and even the rest of the Bible. We've been given the setting, the heavens and the earth, and now people are going to be <clears throat> highlighted. Because the focus in the story is all about redemption. Animals and birds and the moon and plants, these things don't need redeeming. But there's something unique about man and woman. Man was created in the image of God to be in fellowship with him, in relationship with him. And in chapter 2, it's going to spend the time giving the account of this very important event on day 6. So everything we look at is going to be happening on day 6. And, and these are the details of that. And yet, the next verse is even a little bit confusing as it says this. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, and no shrub of the field had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no man to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. <clears throat> so we ask, how can this be? Weren't the plants and the trees created on day three? And yet here we are, day six, and it says there's no shrub and no plant. So this is where we have to go way back into Hebrew text to better understand this. And who better to do that than a Hebrew text scholar that I had to learn about myself. Okay, so his name is Umberto Casuto. He's kind of revered by a lot of theologians today, and that many theologians will hold this interpretation of this verse. He was a professor of Bible at Hebrew University in Jerusalem. He was an Italian historian and biblical and Semitic scholar. He began to publish important papers and books on Bible studies, including Genesis, and his work is, works are still significant today. So in his studies on this text, in the original Hebrew words, he teaches that the word shrub and plant, there we go, shrub and plant, here are actually parts of the land that were to be affected by the fall. So when this says there is no shrub of the field and no plant of the field, that's because those were going to come when the fall happened, when sin entered the world. The plants and trees on day three are already created, and they are here on day six. But there are certain shrubs or certain plants that have not yet appeared because of the innocence of Eden. The shrub, the word for shrub is siach, and the word for plant is ab aseb, aseb. The siach and the aseb of the field are not referring to the vegetation in chapter 1. But what is to come and sprout up when the land is cursed? We can see that in Genesis 3. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you. And you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground. After the fall, we see new sprouts coming up from the land that were not originally there on day three, and they are still not there on day six of creation. Thorns and thistles or weeds. The thorns and thistles are as synonymous to siach. They're synonyms of siach. And the aseb, these are the plants that would produce grain like barley, wheat, and oats. Both of these two things, thorns and thistles, and the plants that produce grain, the siach and the aseb, require two things. They require rain and they require man's toil. So we see here that the siach, the thorns and thistles are the weeds, and the aseb, the grain, had not sprung up, not because we go back to day three, but because there's no rain and there's no man to till them. And when those things spring up from the ground, those are the two things that they're going to need. But there's no need for it right now because the fall hasn't happened. And right now God has just given everything to them in the innocence of Eden because God is the provider. God is the provider. 
It says here, when the Lord God made this, none of those things had sprung up. There was no rain. There was no man to till the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. The water system looked very, very different in the Garden of Eden and in the original place than what we teach our second graders in the water cycle in school today. Looked very, very different. God's original design of watering the earth contained streams or springs that came up from the earth. It was constant and it was consistent. It was readily available and it was reliable and it watered the whole surface of the ground. Now contrast that to rain, what we depend on today. It's inconsistent, it's unreliable, it's unpredictable, and it is given or it is held by the hand of God. If you look at rain throughout scripture, it'll say God brought the rains. When God, you bring the rains. It doesn't just say, oh, earth, provide this. God blesses us with rain or he could use rain as even judgment. In fact, it didn't rain for a thousand years and the first time it did, it came as judgment in the form of the flood, which we will eventually get to. But in the beginning, the water source was ever present, ever available, and ever reliable. It was the streams or springs that came up from the ground. Are you guys familiar with that song? Um, I've got a river of life flowing out of me. You know what? Makes the lame to walk and the blind to see. Opens prisons, doors, set those captives free. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. What's next? Spring up a well within my soul. Spring up a well and make me whole. Spring up a well and give to me abundantly. That's where we get that. Numbers, that comes in numbers actually, numbers 21, 17. Spring up, oh well. Jesus is our eternal spring. He is the story of our redemption. He will be the one who actually brings us back to this original design of creation where there will be no more thorns and thistles, no more weeds, no more pain, no more tears, no stress, no anxiety, no hurt, no loneliness, no suffering. He is our life spring. In John chapter 4, he's speaking to the woman at the well, and he tells her, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The description of creation of the ground being watered through the stream springing up from the ground is how we should be thinking of our own hearts and our own lives. With the living water in us, the spring of life in us, that should water the surface of the ground. It should overflow so thirsty people can drink and experience salvation and eternal life. Jesus is our spring in verse 6. He is predictable. He is reliable. He is life-giving, and he is constant. He does not dry up or come and go. God provided for man in the beginning, and he continues to provide for man today. Through his son Jesus, he provides both spiritually and even physically for our physical needs as well. He is our source of everything, our spring. We also see that God is the creator, God the creator. With the setting being complete and prepared and ready for men, God the creator does his most magnificent work most magnificent work. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. Man was made from the same elements, the same material as the dust and the soil of the ground. The same elements and the same material. Therefore, we know that man did not come as a heavenly spiritual being or a heavenly spiritual child first, birthed in the heavens first and then brought to us. He did not come, we did not evolve from another species of creation. 
His creation came from the dust of the ground, and our makeup tells us that and proves that. We have the same elements and the same material. Now, we are still created in the image of God, bearing those characteristics of self-consciousness, creativity, personality, relationship, intellect, spirituality, all of that were still created in his image. But he, man was formed from the dust of the ground. He did not evolve. He did not come as a heavenly being or spirit child. He was not delivered by a stork, <laughs> despite the pictures and the cute cartoons. God, in his divine ability, took material that he had already created. He formed the physical body and all its intricate components. Think of what your body is made up of. And the ruach, the spirit of life, breathed life into his nostrils, giving him movement and breath and viability. Fully grown, fully aware, full of intellect, yet completely innocent because of the innocence of Eden. Man, wouldn't you have loved to have been there? I would have loved to have witnessed that. To me, that would just try and envision just dust coming together to form a man. That is just divine, miraculous work to its nth degree. We see Adam, which means man, was created first. In chapter 1, we read that he created them, male and female, he created them. But it didn't happen together at the same time. This detailed account that we're looking at in chapter 2 is a description of how each of them were created. Adam first from the dust of the ground. And before creating woman, Adam, or God gives Adam a place to live. And I call this God the realtor. Okay, God the realtor. It says, now the Lord, God, had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there, it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is Pishon. It winds through the entire land of Hivala, where there is gold. And then, I love this parenthesis, the gold of that land is good. <laughs> is there not good gold? I don't know. Aromatic resin and onyx are also there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris. It runs along the west side of Ashur. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden. Or the Lord took the man and put him in paradise. Okay, this is our original paradise. There was food to eat that he didn't have to work for. There was no rain or no bad weather. There was accessible water and it was clean and ever flowing. It looked beautiful and it smelled good. There were no teenage dirty socks or feet infesting the Garden of Eden. It even smelled good, the Bible tells us. It had gold and it had onyx. God was truly the ultimate realtor. Now, good realtors, as we know, they'll find homes for people. They're kind of always in search of the perfect home. Some people are so picky. They have their list. I want four bedrooms and three baths. Give me a three-car garage. I'd like high ceilings, not too high. I'd like to go upstairs. I don't want to walk the stairs. And we know how people can be. It's like all of these checks and this open plan and this open kitchen, and maybe I want a basement, or maybe I want these color cupboards, or this kind of floor. All of these boxes checked. And a good realtor will almost get all the needs or the desires of the client. And then typically the client ends up having to do something themselves to kind of fix it to the way they like it. But they get close enough. I suppose if there was a way that every realtor could meet every single need, they would. Well, God could. Not only did he find the home for Adam, he created it. All the boxes checked. All of it. Eden was God's creation, and the perfect home 
for man that he created. Not only was he a great realtor, he was a fantastic gardener. So he, had, he was his own landscaper. He had everything. Garden view, water view, food at any time, perfect weather, no disappointment. And yet man was still given work to do. He was still given some kind of task. The first occupation comes up. It says the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. Now, before we move on to the job, I want to pay attention to this word put right here. This is really important. If you look back at verse 8, we see that the word put is there as well. He put man there. That literal translation of put is for its common use. Your Bible might even say he placed him there. That is what the word means. Adam was literally physically placed there. But this word for put is the Hebrew word nuach. Nuach. And it means to rest or settle down to have rest. There is a sense of safety here. When we feel safe, we can rest and relax. If you don't feel safe, you're tense looking over your shoulder. What's that? Who's there? Who's coming? But there is no stress in the Garden of Eden. In a sense, we could say God rested him in Eden. He rested him there. That's what put means. He provided safety for him in Eden. This is where he and God had fellowship together with no distractions, no hindrances, no fear. And then God gave Adam a job. He said, the text tells us he took the work, uh, he was to work and take care of it. But we can't actually take this at face value because tilling the ground or working it in that way for food was actually a result of the fall and that haven't happened yet. So what work did he do? <laughs> what was it? His job was to serve God in his garden, in this creation. The words work and take care of are translated cultivate or to keep. So cultivate has the meaning of serve. If you cultivate the garden, you serve. Specifically here, serve God. And the word keep is just meaning of to kind of oversee and watch. So whatever that looked like, what God expected of him at that time, it wasn't the kind of work that we think of today. He, Adam was to worship and obey God by serving him and keeping watch over the garden. Doesn't seem too difficult a task in comparison to how we identify work today, right? But listen, there was no hammock in the garden. We heard a lot of things in there, gold, onyx, trees, rivers, no hammock in the garden. You still had to work, even if that was through serving, worship, obedience, and keeping a watch over what he was given. Idleness was never part of God's design, but his work for man included simply worshiping him and serving him. We can thank the fall for the identification of work now being changed, that we have to work to provide for what we need. God was perfectly content to let his creation, to let his creation take care of all of that for man. But as we'll see next week, man was not as content. He was not as content and ends up disobeying the commander. God the commander we see God's first command in the Bible here. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. Hmm. Okay, and like any good commander, he gives them both the warning and the potential consequence. So let's sum this up. Eat from the tree, die. Don't eat from the tree, live. Nobody, Adam or Eve, could not come back and say, but it was so confusing. <laughs> you can't say that. Eat from the tree, die. Don't eat from the tree, live. It's that simple. Now, there was nothing toxic about the fruit. It wasn't poisonous. This wasn't our Snow White uh, story here. It was the act of disobedience that was going to lead to death. Spiritual death, and of course, eventually physical death, as they would no longer be allowed to eat from the tree of life. This tree of life that was also in the center of the garden, whatever it was, whatever it provided, gave them literal, physical, eternal life forever. 
but that would be taken away. That's you're going to die. You are not going to be able to take the hand from that as well. This was a test to determine man's loyalty, man's satisfaction, and man's trust. It's funny how the brain works, though. I do. I think it's very interesting how the brain works, how curiosity or even doubt can get the best of us. Take a look at this. Do not press this big, shiny red button. <laughs> Who wants to press the button? Yeah. What do you mean don't do it? What's going to happen? You'll surely die. Nah. Everything's been good so far. Or this love. Our brain does this with, with us. We have kind of doubt creeps in. Curiosity creeps in. Who doesn't want to press the button? Anytime we're told do not, it's a test. Will we or won't we? Will we or won't we? If you ladies, and myself included, if we think for a second that we wouldn't have eaten that fruit as well, we're fooling ourselves. We really are. We put a lot of this on Eve, forgetting to put ourselves in her shoes, going, hmm, <laughs> that might have been like a big red shiny button to us as well. In all of this, we see Adam alone in the garden. He's been formed. He's been given life. He's been put and rested in his new home. He's been provided for, and he's been given a job to serve and worship his creator. And God says, the Lord said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. It's time, ladies, what we've been waiting for. It's our entrance into the biblical pages of history. Here we come, okay? Here we come. God, the matchmaker. We read in chapter 1 how God said everything was good or very good. Here, as we're getting our detailed account of creation of man and woman, we see God recognizing the circumstances. He is not saying that any of his creation is not good. He is saying this situation of man being alone is not good. He needs a helper. After all, in chapter 1, verse 28, it says that God blessed them, and he said to them, be fruitful and multiply, rule over the birds and the fish and every living creature. You can't multiply on your own. It takes two to tango, right? He needs a helper. And you all know it's going to require a multitasker to help rule over the birds and the fish and the sea and the, every living creature. <laughs> multitasker. I think Adam's handling the fish and the woman's over here with the birds and the creature and everything else that goes on. Look, just get the bird. Just do the fish, okay? Just do the fish. God uses the word suitable and then he does something very strategic. So let's keep reading. He says, you need a suitable helper. Helper. And then God becomes very strategic. And he says this. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air. And he brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was his name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air, and all the beasts of the field. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So do you see what, you, what God did there? He brought all the animals in front of Adam, in a sense revealing to him, none of these are your match, for Adam to be able to kind of pick up on that. By the way, not even the dog, which is now considered man's best friend, that was not a suitable helper for Adam. Sure, it's a friendly pet and companion. The dog was not a suitable helper. Helper here, she is to be a partner or easier connect no, connect, connect no, con, no. <laughs> connecto, connecto, easier connecto, which means exact correspondence, as in the same species. The animals were created in pairs, male and female as well. Adam, as they're coming through in front of him, and he's got to name them elephant, giraffe, dog, cat, platypus. We're done. Poor platypus. I'm sure that was the last thing coming through. 
All of these things he's naming, and he got, he's, it's like God's revealing to him, you don't have a match. You don't have a pair. You don't have a correspondence that comes with you. Adam could see each of them had their exact species correspondence for being able to be fruitful and multiply. Every male had a female partner or pair, but none of them was his match. None was human. So God literally became the matchmaker. <laughs> Not match finder, matchmaker. The exact correspondence maker. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. We see the first operation taking place. God is the original anesthesiologist. He is the original surgeon in his divine, miraculous way. Although the text says here that he took ribs, this word actually, tzila, the word tzila means part of the man's side. Part of the man's side. It's likely not just one rib. It's kind of interesting. This word tzila is in the Bible 20 times. It's only translated rib here <laughs> in this verse. All the other places, it's translated side. I read a commentary that said this. I thought it was interesting. God did not take from the head as to indicate the woman would surpass him. He did not take from the feet as to indicate she should be trampled on. He took from his side, showing that they are to walk side by side, her near to his heart and dear to him and created equal in God's image. Isn't that a neat thought? The text tells us God made woman. He fashioned a woman. That word means to build. The way that they would take like stone and, and brick and, and, and whatever they use to fashion something beautiful, God made her beautiful. He fashioned her with purpose and with creativity and with intent and with beauty. In fact, the word actually means soft, but not soft in spirit. If you've ever read the Proverbs 31 woman, she is certainly not soft the way we might describe soft as weak. But in beauty, a perfect helper, helpmeet, and companion for him. And when Adam saw her, he wrote a poem. The first poem appears in Genesis. The man said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman for she was taken out of man. Yeah, that was his Valentine card. And guess what? There were plenty of roses in the garden to accompany it. I'm pretty sure of that. <laughs> Adam has recognized his suitable helper, his exact correspondence. Someone like me, bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, no fur, no long trunks, no drooling tongues, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> He's like, I get this person. This is another human being. Adam was created from the dust of the earth. Eve was created from Adam. Both were created in the image of God, bearing his characteristics. Eve is no less created in God's image because she was created from Adam's side. How God choose to create each person does not negate being made in his image. Adam created in the image of God out of dust. Eve created in the image of God out of Adam's side. And both of them created to fellowship with God. Both of them created to serve God and reflect all of God in both their union and in their unity because God is the marriage definer. He now defines marriage. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and they will become one flesh. And man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. God clearly defines marriage in its original and perfect design in the innocence of Eden. The suitable helper for Adam was woman. 
The suitable helper for Adam was woman. Their directive from God was to be fruitful and increase in number. The design for this is between man and woman. The suitable helper for Adam was not another man. It's impossible for a man and a man to be fruitful and to multiply. The only kind of sexual behavior that was beautiful and innocent in its original design was between man and woman in a marriage relationship. Leaving the mother and the father and being united. This is what we consider ideal. This is ideal. This was the design. That then means this excludes all other sexual behaviors that some might consider acceptable or appropriate. Behaviors of anything, adultery, pornography, fornication, sex outside of marriage, homosexuality, polygamy, divorce, lust, rape, seduction. All of these are violations of God's original design and they enticed and they intoxicated the world after the fall when sin entered the world. Any any sexual behavior outside of man and woman in a marriage is a result of sin and is a sin. Just because some of these have now been accepted and paraded and celebrated in society does not change God's ideal. God did not change his mind. After sin came into the world, he did not look at that and go, hmm, change of plans. You know what? Any sexual behavior you all now feel is okay and acceptable is now the new ideal. No, God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He is the same. He defined marriage very clearly and without question when he created man and woman. And Jesus himself refers to this in Matthew. They asked him why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? And Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard, and listen to this, but it was not this way from the beginning. This wasn't the design. This wasn't the plan. All of these other inappropriate sexual behaviors, anything outside of man and woman united in marriage was not supposed to be that way. They came after the fall, after sin entered the world. There are consequences to sin. Hearts get hardened. Selfish choices get made. And Jesus says, it wasn't this way from the beginning. This wasn't the original design. Sin entered the world and prefer, perverted the original design. But praise God for grace and mercy. Because we can't out -sin God. You cannot out -sin God. His grace is sufficient. He spoke to Paul. He said, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. I want to read from this book. It's by Jackie Hill Perry. It's called Gay Girl, Good God. You don't have to struggle with same-sex attraction to relate to this section that I'm going to read here out of her book. The first time I read this, I remember I was sitting on an airplane and I just wept. Because we all can relate to what she is going to say here. In our own way, we may not identify with the same struggle but we can put our own struggle in there. She says, something holy was happening here now. The God who made light to shine in the darkness was now doing this work in me, this work of breaking into and overcoming the blindness I was born embracing. Jesus started making sense. I mean, he is God. Who gave mercy my address or told it how to get to my room? Didn't it know a sinner lived in it? On the way down the hall, shouldn't the smell of idols kept its feet from moving any closer? Then I remembered the one verse of the Bible that I knew by heart. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. The same Bible that condemned me held in it the promises that could save me. I just had to believe it. That's true for all of us. It doesn't matter what other struggle we're in, whether it's a sexual struggle, a sin struggle, or some other struggle. If you have Jesus Christ in your heart, mercy found your address. Mercy found your address. Because God's grace is sufficient for you. His power made perfect in weakness. That is the beauty of Jesus and the Spirit being our living well, springing up within our soul. In the beginning was the innocence of Eden. The land was pure. It was without weeds, without thistles, without thorns. The water supply was abundant and available. The marriage bed pure and holy without shame. The man and woman, they were confident in who they were. They were unashamed. They were purposed with the task of serving and worshiping God in a home where all was provided and safe. The beginning was good. It was very, very good. I'm not going to lie. Things are about to get chaotic. They're about to get chaotic. But when we understand this beginning, the innocence of Eden, we are now living in the middle, but we can now become hopeful and appreciate the end even more because it is going to come back to one day where we are all going to be in that beginning. We are going to come back to the innocence of Eden. Jesus is going to return. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, and it's going to be the innocence again. So we understand the beginning, we live in the middle, changed for the better, overflowing the spring of flowing water so others too can be saved and experience the joy of the end that's coming. Let me pray. Father, we love you so much. What a beautiful beginning you created. Oh, so hard to even imagine with so much sin and hurt and pain in this world that we, we live in the midst of. It's sometimes hard to even fathom and wrap our minds around what that must have been like. The innocence of Eden, the beauty of no shame, being rest, worshiping you, serving you. God, we long for that. Give us that in our hearts. Give us a desire and a longing for that. Lord, keep us hopeful for that. Keep us humbled that you've promised that to return that way again, to return all things, to restore all things. What an amazing hope we have. We hold on to that. Let our conversations this morning be sweet and acceptable in your sight. Let us grow ever stronger in you and our walk with you. We love you and we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.